Good day, everyone. For today's topic, we will be discussing the history and a brief introduction of the COVID-19. Everyone in the world, medical people or non-medical related personnel, are very much well aware of the newest pandemic that has affected all of us for the past two years. It is also high time for us to get to know more about COVID-19, not just the virus, but also its history, its associated disease, what can we do to protect ourselves, the different symptoms that we should be looking out for, and the newest discoveries in order to fight against this catastrophic global health that we are facing right now. Let's start first with the brief origin of the coronavirus disease 2019. On December 31, 2019, World Health Organization was informed of cases of pneumonia of a known cause in Wuhan City, China. A novel coronavirus was identified as the cause by Chinese authorities on January 7, 2020 and was temporarily named as 2019 NCOV or otherwise known as the 2019 novel coronavirus. Again class, as a recap, coronaviruses are large family of viruses that cause illness ranging from the common cold or the flu to more severe diseases. A novel coronavirus is a new strain that has not been previously identified in humans. The new virus was subsequently named the COVID-19 virus. On January 30, 2020, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus who is also the World Health Organization Director General, he declared the novel coronavirus outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. By the way, class, if the outbreak is considered to be a public health emergency of international concern, this is the World Health Organization's highest level of alarm. And at that time, there were already 98 cases, but no deaths were reported in 18 different countries outside of China. On March 11, 2020, there is already a rapid increase in the number of cases in and outside of China, which led the World Health Organization's Director General to announce that the outbreak could be characterized as a pandemic. By then, more than 118,000 cases had been reported in 114 countries and a total of 4,291 deaths had been recorded. If majority of us can remember, by mid-March of that same year, 2020, the World Health Organization European region had become the epicenter of the epidemic reporting over 40% of globally confirmed cases. And as of April 28, 2020, 63% of global mortality from the virus was from the European region. Since the first cases were reported, WHO has worked around the clock to support countries to prepare and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Kindly take note of these important figures. As of April 1, 2022, globally, there have been 486,761,597 confirmed cases of COVID-19, and that includes 6,142,735 deaths that are reported to the World Health Organization. As of March 26, 2022, there's already a total of 11,054,362,790 
vaccine doses that have been administered to the general population. The next following figures are focused more on the Republic of the Philippines, so kindly take note of this as well. From January 3, 2020 to April 1, 2022, there have been 3,678,245 confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 59,249 deaths that are already reported to the World Health Organization. And as of March 16, 2022, a total of 139,948,193 vaccine doses have been administered to the Filipinos. Before we proceed with a brief description of the COVID-19 virus, I want you to take a look at this COVID-19 timeline and study this as well. Let us now proceed to the brief description and introduction of the COVID-19 virus. But before we dwell on the lecture proper, I want you to watch this short video created by Nucleus Medical Media. I find it really educational and easy to understand. This is SARS-CoV-2. It belongs to the family of coronaviruses named for the crown-like spikes on their surfaces. SARS-CoV-2 can cause COVID-19, a contagious viral infection that attacks primarily your throat and lungs. What actually happens in your body when you contract the coronavirus? What exactly causes your body to develop pneumonia? And how would a vaccine work? The coronavirus must infect living cells in order to reproduce. Let's have a closer look. Inside the virus, genetic material contains the information to make more copies of itself. A protein shell provides a hard protective enclosure for the genetic material as the virus travels between the people it infects. An outer envelope allows the virus to infect cells by merging with the cell's outer membrane. Projecting from the envelope are spikes of protein molecules. Both a typical influenza virus and the new coronavirus use their spikes like a key to get inside a cell in your body, where it takes over the cell's internal machinery, repurposing it to build the components of new viruses. When an infected person talks, coughs, or sneezes, droplets carrying the virus may land in your mouth or nose and then move into your lungs. Once inside your body, the virus comes in contact with cells in your throat, nose, or lungs. One spike on the virus inserts into a receptor molecule on your healthy cell membrane like a key in a lock. This action allows the virus to get inside your cell. A typical flu virus would travel inside a sac made from your cell membrane to your cell's nucleus that houses all its genetic material. The coronavirus, on the other hand, doesn't need to enter the host cell nucleus. It can directly access parts of the host cell called ribosomes. Ribosomes use genetic information from the virus to make viral proteins, such as the spikes on the virus's surface. A packaging structure in your cell then carries the spikes in vesicles which merge with your cell's outer layer, the cell membrane. All the parts needed to create a new virus gather just beneath your cell's membrane. Then, a new virus begins to bud off from the cell's membrane. Now, with the virus spreading in your body, how can you develop pneumonia symptoms? For this, we'll have to look into your lungs. Each lung has separate sections called lobes. Normally, as you breathe, air moves freely through your trachea or windpipe, then through large tubes called bronchi, through smaller tubes called bronchioles, and finally into tiny sacs called alveoli. Your airways and alveoli are flexible and springy. When you breathe in, each air sac inflates like a small balloon. And when you exhale, the sacs deflate. Small blood vessels called capillaries surround your alveoli. Oxygen from the air you breathe passes into your capillaries, and then carbon dioxide from your body passes out of your capillaries into your alveoli so that your lungs can get rid of it when you exhale. 
Your airways catch most germs in the mucus that lines your trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. In a healthy body, hair like cilia lining the tubes constantly push the mucus and germs out of your airways where you might expel them by coughing. Normally, cells of your immune system attack viruses and germs that make it past your mucus and cilia and enter your alveoli. However, if your immune system is weakened, like in the case of a coronavirus infection, the virus can overwhelm your immune cells and your bronchioles and alveoli become inflamed as your immune system attacks the multiplying viruses. The inflammation can cause your alveoli to fill with fluid, making it difficult for your body to get the oxygen it needs. You could develop lober pneumonia, where one lobe of your lungs is affected, or you could have bronchopneumonia that affects many areas of both lungs. Pneumonia may cause difficulty breathing, chest pain, coughing, fever and chills, confusion, headache, muscle pain, and fatigue. It can also lead to more serious complications. Respiratory failure occurs when your breathing becomes so difficult that you need a machine called a ventilator to help you breathe. These are the machines that save lives and that medical device companies currently ramp up production for. Whether you would develop these symptoms depends on a lot of factors, such as your age and whether you already have an existing condition. While this all sounds scary, the push to develop a coronavirus vaccine is moving at high speed. Studies of other coronaviruses led most researchers to assume that people who have recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 infection could be protected from reinfection for a period of time. But that assumption needs to be backed by empirical evidence and some studies suggest otherwise. There are several different approaches for a potential vaccine against the coronavirus. The basic idea is that you would get a shot that contains faint versions of the virus. The vaccine would expose your body to a version of the virus that is too weak to cause infection, but just strong enough to stimulate an immune response. Within a few weeks, cells in your immune system would make markers called antibodies, which would be specific for only the coronavirus or specifically its spike protein. Antibodies then attach to the virus and prevent it from attaching to your cells. Your immune system then responds to signals from the antibodies by consuming and destroying the clumps of viruses. If you then catch the real virus at a later stage, your body would recognize it and destroy it. In other words, your immune system is now primed. Collecting evidence on whether this will be possible, safe, and effective is part of what's taking researchers so long to develop a vaccine. It's a race against time to develop a vaccine amid a pandemic. Each step in vaccine development usually takes months, if not years. An Ebola vaccine broke records by being ready in five years. The hope here is to develop one for the new coronavirus in a record-breaking 12 to 18 months. While all of this will take time, stay home if you can to protect the most vulnerable. And don't forget to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds and as often as possible. So for the recap, coronavirus or the COVID-19 is known to be an infectious disease caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Again, before it was named as COVID-19, it was known to be what? The novel coronavirus. And this novel coronavirus class is a new strain of coronavirus that has not been previously identified to um, infect humans. And then after that, this novel coronavirus has caused severe pneumonia in several cases in China and has been exported to a range of countries and cities around the world. Though the original source of viral transmission to humans remains unclear, as does whether the virus became pathogenic before or after the spillover event. Why did I say spillover? Remember class that the most likely ecological reservoir for SARS-CoV-2 are bats but it is believed that the virus jumped the species barrier to humans from another intermediate animal host this intermediate animal host could be either a domestic food animal or a wild animal or a domesticated wild animal which has not yet been identified up to this time though this is not the only coronavirus that has infected humans since um, coronaviruses are a group of related viruses that can cause diseases both mammals and birds. Human coronaviruses are capable of causing illnesses ranging from the common cold to a more severe disease such as the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome which has a fatality rate of 34%. In fact, SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh known coronavirus to infect people after 229E, NL63, OC43, HKU1, MERS-CoV, and the original SARS-CoV. 
usually for those people infected with the virus that experience mild to moderate respiratory illness can recover without requiring special treatment. However, some will become seriously ill and require medical attention. Older people and those with underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, or cancer are more likely to develop serious illness. Anyone can get sick with COVID-19 and become seriously ill or die at any age. So the best way to prevent and slow down transmission is to be well informed about the disease and how the virus spreads. Take a look at this infographic by NCDHHS and check if are you high risk to be infected with COVID-19. We can always take actions to reduce our exposure and risk of getting sick with COVID-19. So check if are you in a close household contact with a person diagnosed with COVID-19? Does your parents already belong to the senior citizen category? So check that out as well. Or does anyone from the family or your friends have underlying health conditions? I know we are all very much well aware how the virus can spread from an infected person's mouth or nose in small liquid particles when they cough, sneeze, speak, sing, or breathe. These particles range from larger respiratory droplets to smaller aerosols. COVID-19 transmits when people breathe in the air contaminated by droplets and small airborne particles containing the virus. And the risk of breathing these in is highest when people are in close proximity, but they can be inhaled over longer distances, particularly indoors. So transmission can also occur if splashed or sprayed with contaminated fluids in our eyes, nose, or mouth, and rarely via contaminated surfaces. According to World Health Organization, there is still no confirmed timeline how long a COVID-19 virus survives in surfaces. However, most likely it behaves like other coronaviruses. Studies show that coronaviruses can survive on surfaces for a few hours up to several days depending on varied conditions like the type of surface, the temperature surrounding that type of surface, and the humidity of the environment. Which types of settings does COVID-19 spread more easily? Remember class always, the three C's? It is very useful way to think about this. So they describe settings where transmission of the COVID-19 virus spreads more easily. The first C are the crowded places. The next is close contact settings, especially where people have conversations very near each other. And the third C is confined and enclosed spaces with poor ventilation. I remember I was also asked if one can get COVID-19 from drinking or um, recreational water. Actually, class, drinking water is not transmitting COVID-19. And if you swim in a swimming pool or in a pond, you cannot still get COVID-19 through water. But what can happen if you go to a swimming pool which is crowded and if you are close to the other people, and if someone is infected with COVID-19, then you can be, of course, affected. What about the COVID-19 incubation timeline? Class, people with mild symptoms who are otherwise healthy should manage their symptoms at home. On average, it takes around 5 to 6 days from when someone is infected with the virus for the symptoms to show. However, it can also take up to 14 days for it to exhibit the symptoms. Miss, what is incubation period again? So class, incubation period is the number of days between 
when you got infected with something, and when you might see symptoms. When researchers set out to learn the incubation period for the original strain of the coronavirus, since we're also very much knowledgeable about the viruses that are constantly changing, which sometimes leads to new strains called the variants. And as of this time, we have Delta and Omicron variants of the COVID-19. Once again, on average, symptoms showed up in the newly infected person about five to six days after contact. Rarely, symptoms appear as soon as two days after exposure. But most people with symptoms had them by day 12. And most of the other ill people were sick by day 14. In rare cases, symptoms can show up after 14 days. Though the researchers think that the latter happens with about one out of every 100 people. There are also instances that some people may have the coronavirus but never show symptoms. Others may not know that they have it because their symptoms are very mild. The current studies might not include the mildest cases and the incubation period could be different for these. That's why class, we still don't put our guards down in dealing with other people because infected people can still transmit the virus even if they are asymptomatic. This is why it is important that all people who are infected are identified by testing, later on be isolated, and depending on the severity of their disease, they must receive medical care. What are the symptoms of COVID-19? The most common symptoms include fever, cough, tiredness, and the loss of taste or smell. The less common symptoms include sore throat, headache, aches and pains, diarrhea, a rash and skin or discoloration of fingers or toes, and red or irritated eyes. And the more serious symptoms include difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, the loss of speech or mobility or confusion, and chest pain. Seek immediate medical attention if you have serious symptoms, and always make a call before visiting your doctor or health facility. However, for people with mild symptoms who are otherwise healthy should manage their symptoms at home. There are actually a lot of reminders and minimum standard health protocols that was set by different countries, but the World Health Organization continues to encourage individuals to take care of their own health and protect others by washing your hands frequently with water and soap or using hand sanitizing gel if water and soap is not available, maintaining social distancing, Making sure that you keep a distance of one meter or three feet between yourself and anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Or in general, you don't know if they're asymptomatic, so it's best if you stay away from them and maintain a one meter or three feet distance. Also, avoiding to touch your eyes, nose, and mouth if you haven't washed your hands yet, just yet. And of course, wearing a mask is very needed. Following respiratory hygiene by covering your mouth and nose with your folded elbow or tissue when you cough or sneeze, then disposing of the used tissue immediately. Seek medical care early if you have a fever, cough, and difficulty breathing. And staying informed and following advice given by your health care provider, the national and local public health authority, or employer on how to protect yourself and others from COVID-19. Also, to prevent infection and to slow transmission of COVID-19, you may do the following. Number one, get vaccinated when a vaccine is available to you. So you can view my YouTube video regarding debunking the mysteries of COVID-19. 
Choose open, well-ventilated spaces over closed ones. If you're indoors, open at least a window. Always, always, always wash your hands regularly with soap and water or clean them with alcohol-based hand rub. If you feel unwell, stay home and self-isolate until you recover. The next following slides are a little bit reiterated, but it is still best for us to be reminded of the different guidelines, reminders, and minimum standard health protocols that should be followed and practiced. As in the words of Dr. Hans Henry P. Kluge, the World Health Organization's Regional Director for Europe, he said that through transparent knowledge sharing, tailored support on the ground, and steadfast solidarity, we will all beat COVID-19. We will always and forever be grateful to all the frontliners fighting with us to beat COVID-19. We are all in this together. Thank you so much for listening, class. I hope you've learned something new from me today. And God bless you always. Keep safe.